I want you to go beyond being a friend with your partner. I want you to make a conscious decision to promote your partner's self-esteem. Promote your partner's self-esteem. Now, let's think about what self-esteem means, because we use that word a lot, but nobody ever really defines it. Self-esteem. How well does one regard themselves? How proud of themselves are they? How much do they like themselves? How much confidence do they have? You know, how good do they feel about themselves? There's something that we refer to in psychology sometimes. It's called the health-engendering personality. You can look this up if you want to and read about it. It's a thing. Health-engendering personality. I have a really long-time dear friend that has the best health-engendering personality I may have ever encountered, and that's Oprah. I've known Oprah since, oh gosh, I guess 96, so coming up on 20, 3, 4, 5 years. And I have watched her, I've experienced it myself, I watched her with, I don't know, a thousand other people, hundreds of other people one-on-one over all those years. And it doesn't make any difference whether it's with a president of the United States, a senator, a janitor cleaning up in the studio as we're leaving, a parking lot attendant, a waiter in a restaurant, whatever. She has this ability that whenever she interacts with someone, they feel better about who they are when they get through talking to her. She just has this way of engaging them, focusing on them in a way that they walk away feeling better about who they are and what they have to offer in this life than they did before they walked up and engaged with her. And it's not just that they have a glow about they got to talk to Oprah. You know, everybody would be excited that they got to talk to Oprah Winfrey. I mean, come on. Who doesn't like Oprah? People would be excited about talking to her. But it's not that. It's more than that. It's that they have a deeply personal experience in talking with her, and she impacts them in a way that they walk away with their shoulders back and their head held a little higher, feeling good about who they are and where they are in this world. Now, some people just do that naturally. It's just a quality that they have, and I suspect Oprah was that way in grade school. She was probably that way in college. She's certainly been that way for the 25 years that I've known her, and I suspect that's why she was one of the most clarion voices, if not the clarion voice in the history of television. I think that's why millions of people flock to watch her every day, because they would just watch her and hear what she had to say and share in the stories that she presented, and they just felt better about themselves. That's what I want you to do with your partner. I want you to make a conscious decision that whatever your interaction is going to be with your partner, you're going to do it in such a way that they feel better about who they are after talking to you than they did before they started. That some way, somehow during that conversation, you're going to validate that person. You're going to honor that person. You're going to make them know that you're proud of them and that they should be proud of themselves. You're going to find something about them that you can comment on, focus on, single out, mirror back to them, reflect on, that is a positive about them. Maybe it's their looks, their grooming, the way they presented something, how they carry themselves, the idea or comment that they had to make, whatever it is, but you're going to interact with them in a way that they can't possibly walk away from you and not feel better about who they are. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with what they say. That's not what I'm saying. That's playing the nice guy. Playing the nice guy can really cheat a person. It can really be condescending. That's not what I'm talking about. You can disagree with someone. You can fire someone from their job, and they can walk away feeling better about themselves than they did before they walked up. And you're probably thinking, now, okay, you lost me there. How are you going to do that? How are you going to fire somebody, and they're going to feel better about themselves than they did before they walked up? Well, You might have to focus on their good qualities. You might have to focus about the contribution they've made while they're there, how painful it's going to be to have to let them go, the fact that they don't fit the organization and how unique their talent is and how special they are and how 
strongly you believe in them and are going to help them moving forward and comment on the positive things that they've done while they were there, whatever you can find to comment on about them. And of course, that's the ultimate stretch. And I'm not saying when you break up with somebody, you don't give them the old, hey, it's me, not you. You know, that doesn't fly. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about whether you're checking out of the grocery store with a clerk, whether you're talking to your children, whether you're engaging with a friend. And it isn't always about paying people a compliment. One of the most powerful things you can do for people to feel better about themselves is to give them your absolute undivided attention. Stop what you're doing. Don't look at your phone. Put your phone down. Put it in your pocket. Look them in the eye. Here's a unique thought. Look them in the eye. Engage with them. Be 100% present when you're talking to them. Ask questions about what they're saying. Follow up with what they're saying. Show an interest in what they have to say. Be engaged. Be 100% fully present. People's favorite topic is themselves. Sorry, it just is. People's favorite topic is themselves. Somebody can come up and talk to you, you look them in the eye, they tell you something's going on, you ask a few questions and follow up, and say, well, you know, thanks for sharing that. Now, if you've got just a minute, tell me about you. How are you doing? Tell me what's going on in your life. Well, tell me about that. That is so interesting. Thanks for sharing that with me. I appreciate you taking the time to share that with me. Just Show an interest in them, a curiosity about them, and then listen intently. Be 100% present when you're talking to that person. There is nothing more rude than somebody to be talking to you and telling you something particularly personal, and you're reading your phone. I go to these restaurants, and I see people on their phone the entire time, standing on the street. Who are they talking to? If they need to be somewhere else, why are they here? If whoever they're texting with or emailing or talking to on the phone is so important, why are they not there instead of here? If you need to talk to this person so badly, I will be happy to excuse you. You can call an Uber or something and go over there and be with them and text me. I don't know. But it's so rude. Be with your partner. If your spouse comes in the room and you're watching TV, here's a thought. Pause the TV. Turn it off. Pause it. I've I've actually seen this in the last week. A husband at the breakfast bar in the kitchen watching TV, and his wife keeps talking to him, and he turned up the volume. He's like, okay, you're going to talk to me. I'm going to turn up the volume. Why didn't he just hit her in the head, throw water in her face or something? How rude. I thought, oh, my God. I need to get out of here. He actually turned up the volume to drown her out. She did not walk away feeling better about who she was. I mean, that's like the worst. The only thing he could have done was then pick up his phone and start texting someone. Be 100% present. Look them in the eye. Be engaged. Show an interest in what they're talking about. Ask a follow-up question. Then ask about them. That makes people feel valid that there's something there. And number six, you're just going to have to be honest with yourselves about this. You've got to air your frustrations in the right direction, and that is opposed to non-directional venting. And here's what I mean by that. Look, your day is full of frustrations, right? And so what we tend to do, and this is what drives the first four-minute comment that I made earlier, is we come home and we vent to our partners. We vent to our mates. Maybe we're frustrated at work. We didn't get the raise that we asked for. We didn't get the promotion that we wanted. Or there's somebody at work that is just annoying and irritating. Or the kids have just been impossible that day. And then you get with your partner and you're just so frustrated you could eat a tin can. And so you just start venting at them, venting all that frustration. And you're just putting them on blast. They didn't do a damn thing. Why are you venting at them? Because they're handy. They're handy as a pocket on a shirt. You've got all this frustration, all this resentment, all of this pent-up frustration, rage, and here is a target. And you may think, well, that's what partners are for. 
No, 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 it's not. That's not what they're for. That is not what they're for at all. And your job is to sort out the sources of your frustration. If you have a frustration with your partner, then you can deal with that with your partner after the first four minutes. But if you've got frustrations at work, then deal with them at work. If you've got frustrations with your brother or your sister or your mother or your father or your kids or your golf game or something, then deal with that there. Don't vent to your partner. Don't take it out on your partner. You've had a tough day at work. Don't come home and browbeat your partner because you didn't have the guts to say it to your boss. This is a huge deal. I can't tell you how much this happens in relationships. And if you would stop doing that, you would be astounded how much angst would disappear in your relationship. Aim your frustrations in the right direction. Air them out where they happen. Don't deal with them all at home. Look, there's a lot of frustration in life. There's financial pressures. There's job pressures. And if you got a job, you got pressures. If you got a job without pressure, you don't have a job. You're just going down there and somebody's paying you. If you got a job without pressure, then seriously, <laughs> you don't really have a job. So there's going to be pressure and it's going to build up and you're going to want to vent it. You just don't go home and vent it. And you say, well, now wait a minute. I feel if I can't go home and talk to my partner, what kind of relationship is that? Well, don't put words in my mouth. I didn't say you can't go home and talk to your partner. I said you cannot go home and vent frustrations that your partner has nothing to do with on your partner. Deal with that where it happens. You're frustrated with a teacher at school about your kid? Handle that with your teacher. If you're frustrated with your supervisor at work, handle that with your supervisor. Wherever your frustration is born, deal with it there. And then you can come home and say, oh, man, I was so frustrated today at work, and I dealt with it. So sure glad I got a soft place to fall. Let's go sit on the patio and relax a minute. That's a whole lot better than coming home and just putting your partner on blast. Now, listen, I'm not making this stuff up. I've been doing this for 45 years. I've seen this over and over and over and over again. 